yeah. Okay, so uh, welcome to the course. Uh, this is a bummer, right, that we're uh, online. Um, I thought hard about it, right? We had the option between everybody wearing masks uh, and going uh, online only. Uh, and I know I can't understand a word that anybody says when they're wearing masks. So I thought it was probably the least disruptive option for us to go uh, online uh, and then to transition back to kind of in-person um, where we can all kind of fully see and understand each other uh, once we're uh, allowed to do that. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm going to do, or we're going to do three things today. We're going to we're going to I'm going to uh, ruin your guys' lives, right? And that rather than kind of giving you the syllabus run through and talking about what we, the expectations are for the course, I'm going to jump in making you guys solve a really, really hard problem uh, at the very start of this thing. Uh, and hopefully that will give us some insights into why we need to study agricultural policy and sort of what tools um, we're going to use to be able to answer some questions related to uh, agricultural policy. Then after that, I'm going to tell you um, who am I, right? You're going to be listening to me up here blabbing uh, for a whole semester. You might want to get to know uh, who I am, uh, my background, sort of my motivation, uh, hopefully so that we can trust each other and feel kind of open um, to communicate uh, back and forth. And then after that, we will go through um, an overview of the course uh, and sort of the expectations. And so I can see a lot of uh, y'all already are doing a good job of sharing your videos. Uh, it makes me sort of feel like I'm talking to an empty room. Uh, if, you're, if you don't share your videos, that's totally fine. But if you are able to share your uh, videos so I can see kind of who uh, I'm talking to and we can have that interaction back and forth, um, that'd be awesome. All right, so let's get started um, with why the heck do we care about agricultural policy? We've had agriculture since the beginning of time, uh, not since the beginning of time, but we've had sort of domesticated agriculture for many, many, many thousands of years uh, in the world. Why are we still studying the importance of agricultural policy today? Haven't we figured this stuff out? Uh, and I think the answer to that is no, right? Agricultural policy is still really, really uh, evolving. And it is very, very important to understand the economics uh, of agricultural policy uh, in order to um, not make um, or to make, make the lives of farmers and consumers uh, sort of as good as possible. So I want to give you uh, an example of when we're not using economics tools to um, answer agricultural policy questions, how things might go wrong. Uh, okay, so you guys have all seen, hopefully, uh, if you've satisfied the prereqs, you've all seen a supply and demand graph that looks something like this, right? So we've got some agricultural policy, which is supplied according to this um, supply schedule here, consumers or, or, or downstream manufacturers demand this agricultural policy according to this demand schedule. Everybody's familiar with this, right? Kyle is slightly, Christina is slightly, and no one else cares. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So, so uh, well, let's just start off then as the first part of this test. If we have this uh, supply and demand schedule uh, and it, this market is sort of unregulated, uh, where does this market come into equilibrium? Like where do producers choose to produce, consumers choose to consume, uh, and at what price? I see Ashley is smirking and waiting over there. <laughs> I know this is an easy one, but it will help me just for someone other than myself to talk. Are you asking exactly like where the equilibrium is at? Is that where you're 
Yes. Okay, it's right where the supply line and demand line intersect. That's like always the right answer in economics, right? Where supply, where the two lines intersect. So this market will tend toward equilibrium where um, the supply uh, of the product is equal to the demand for the product. So in equilibrium, producers will con uh, produce Q star units of whatever this commodity is. Uh, consumers will consume Q, Q star of whatever the, ever this commodity is, and this stuff will be um, produced and sold at price P star. Um, now I want to um, give a specific example here. And so if you took my master's level agricultural marketing class, uh, you've seen this before. So please don't kind of ruin um, this for, for all of us here. But I want, I want to take you guys to a specific example in that I want you guys to go back in time to um, the late 1940s, early 1950s. Uh, and I want to go to Soviet Russia. OK, and Soviet Russia is unique from the U.S. Uh, in that in the U.S. we use a free market system where we let um, supply and uh, demand determine sort of how markets work. In Soviet Russia, that's not what happened, right? In Soviet Russia, we had um, the government, uh, according to whatever sort of its uh, optimization process was, um, allocating land for production, uh, allocating, um, setting prices, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So we were heavily operating uh, in this market. And so suppose this is the market for bread in Soviet Russia, right? And so in equilibrium without the government regulating, we would um, produce and consume Q star units of bread in this market to be sold at price P star. And suppose you're Russia and you really do care about your citizens. And you say, I see my people and they are poor and they are hungry. I don't want them to have to be paying this price P star for bread, right? We need more bread at a lower price. So suppose you as the government of Russia come in and you say, no, you are not allowed to sell bread at this equal market equilibrium price P star. Instead, we are going to set a price ceiling of P uh, over bar here in this market saying, no one can sell bread in this market for a price higher than P bar. Um, a, let's see. So that's the setting. Some intuition for this course is that markets always clear in reality, right? Producers and consumers aren't sort of mindless robots. Producers and consumers have incentives. They are smart um, actors, agents, economic agents, and they will respond to whatever market conditions you give them uh, in order to make um, supply and demand equate. Markets will always clear. Now, with this setting, with this price ceiling of P bar, my question to you is, where does the market clear and how? Where P bar intersects with the supply curve. Okay, so tell me that, Ashley. So at, at, at P bar, the, um, the price here is P bar, and we get this amount of production. Q, we'll call that QS, right? At that amount of production, or at this price, we've got this amount of production. At this price, how much bread is demanded in this market? It's, it's where P bar intersects with the demand curve. Exactly, right? So we, it, it's the story that Rush is telling, right? That, oh my gosh, we've got all these poor people who are desperately hungry trying to feed their family. If they see this low, low price P bar, wow, we are gonna respond by um, demanding a whole bunch of bread in this market. So if market's clear, and Ashley, you can, you can continue on with this or you can say, I'm tired of talking to you, Alex. If market's always clear, 
how does this market clear, right? Because we've got this quantity that producers are choosing to supply in this market. We've got this amount that consumers are choosing to demand in this market. And as a result of this policy, we've created a huge gap, right? That there is so much more demand in this market than there is supply. So right now, we haven't sort of told a story of how this market clears. So there's a shortage. Some people have to go without. Who? How does that work, Grace? Some consumers just don't get the bread that they're demanding. And so how does that, um, how does that allocation process happen, right? Because we're, the story that I'm trying to tell you and maybe you're not yet convinced of is that these markets will clear. Uh, and, and you're saying, well, it, it clears uh, somehow that the price continues to be at P-bar uh, and some people get the bread and then just some others seemingly at random are just kind of left um, unsatisfied or left to go hungry. How do we determine who are those that get the bread versus those that don't get the bread? Austin, I think you're in here twice. So if you can mute yourself actually i'll do it for you man will they raise the price of bread so jack that's the that's the that's the hard part here is that we've got this price ceiling right so we're not allowed those producers aren't allowed to respond by raising uh that price i'll give you a hint that you guys uh have observed this answer, right? You, you guys all uh, know the answer and that we've sort of uh, seen it either in movies or on TV. Black market. Tell me that story, dude. Um, they want to sell bread for more and people want bread, so they just sell it behind the government's back. Okay, beautiful. So uh, who was it that just spoke right then? John. John, thanks. Okay, so John tells this story. Um, I want you guys to go with me to um, Soviet Russia, and I want you to pitch, picture um, the bread factory that you've all seen. And we've got the smoke coming out of the smokestacks. It's cold and gray. Uh, and then there's the long line of people out front waiting for the bread. Uh, and then John tells this story. Well, actually, in addition to this line out front of the bread factory, there's someone out back. Uh, there's a there's a person out back in the back of the bread factory that says, psst, psst, come here, come here. And so uh, if you walk over to this guy out behind the bread factory, he says, you don't have to wait in this line. I'll give you the bread right now, but you've got to pay a way higher price, right? Uh, and so uh, essentially, so John's exactly right. Uh, Jack was right too, right? I gave I gave Jack a hard time here, but but Jack was a, 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 a exactly right that the kind of advertised price in this market continues to be to be P bar, but if you go back around behind the bread factory, you can get your bread right now uh, for a higher price. Uh, it's just a price that we don't advertise. And what would that price be in order for this market to clear? Where would we see equilibrium in that context? Where supply meets demand? You're saying right here. Is that right? Yes. So that's one that's one potential outcome. I think it's it's more likely that we would continue to produce this QS uh, right here, uh, and then they would sell it on the black market for this much, much higher price, we'll call that PM, uh, which is P, ah, let's call it PB for P black market. Okay, and so at this, in this scenario, our marginal cost of production continues to be right here along the supply curve, but our price for the bread is way, way up here. And so what's the difference here between our marginal cost and our price? What is this area? I 
I didn't hear that. Will somebody say that again? The producer surplus? Yes. Uh, and, and specifically, what kind of producer surplus? Oh, gosh. Um... So if we've got marginal cost down here and price right here, the difference between price and marginal cost is our profits, right? And so these are profits, this difference right here, these are profits going to those kind of uh, nefarious guys who are hanging out behind the bread shop, willing to engage uh, in kind of illegal behavior. So these are black market profits. Okay, so that's one uh, potential and that's a realistic potential. Are there any other potentials? Suppose we, as the government, crack down on this, these black market uh, actors and send them all um, to the gulags. How does the market clear then? I sort of gave you a hint um, when I was describing the, the bread factory, right? So remember, there's this big bread, bread factory, it's cold and bleak, and there are smoke stacks with smoke coming out the top. And then what did I say was out front of the bread factory? Or just based on your, your picture of this story, what's out front of that bread factory? A long line of people. A long line of people. And so Jack, how does that change? Um, how does that change specifically our demand curve here in relation to uh, this market for bread? I mean, if there's a long line of people, then your demand increases. But I mean, since we, uh, I'm asking what happens when the price increases because of the black market or? So this know? is, we're saying, suppose the black market doesn't happen. What's an alternative explanation for how this market clears? You could shift the demand curve. They could uh, buy substitute products. So actually, actually, you're exactly right here that the, the result of that line we can think about as an inward shift uh, in the demand curve, right? Because now the cost is no longer just the money that we've paid for that bread. The cost is those hours and hours and hours that I have to spend out in the Russian weather, the, the cold, harsh environment of Moscow waiting for this bread, right? So I'm paying not only with money, but I'm also paying with my time uh, and sort of my misery in terms of getting this bread, right? So as a result of that, we have now less bread being consumed in this market. Our, our, our goal as the government was to provide more people bread at a lower price. What have we, uh, what have we done uh, in both of the scenarios we've talked about so far, both the black market and the um, long lines for bread? In both of those scenarios, we have given our um, consumers, our, our poor citizens, less access to bread by this seemingly benevolent policy. So I've got one more um, potential scenario in which this market can clear. So suppose uh, we've got the, we've cracked down on the black market. We've sent those guys to the gulag. So they're out of the picture. Uh, we see these people in long lines for bread and the government says, no, this is not how this policy was supposed to work. So they go to the bread manufacturers and they say, bread manufacturers, screw you guys. We said, produce this bread um, at P bar so that these people can get the amount of bread they've demanded. Is there a scenario, uh, and the answer is yes, what is the scenario in which we do see um, the market clear at this level QD, and why might that still not be the equilibrium we want? The government could pay the bread makers but they ain't, they ain't going to actually. They don't want to do that. Yeah, so they I came to them with a screw you, right? This is <laughs> gulag or else. Uh, and so the, the sort of implicit port, point here is that when the government comes to these bread manufacturers and he says, screw you to the bread manufacturers, produce more, what do the bread manufacturers say back?
it's the answer is screw you government right so how do they simultaneously how do these bread manufacturers simultaneously say screw you government at the same time kind of artificially satisfying this request that the government's given how does this happen and let me give you a hint that in this space that we've depicted we've got price and quantity there's another dimension uh, that we haven't discussed yet in this in this uh, production space. Is it labor? Um, potentially, there is something we could sort of substitute uh, in this um, to shift the marginal costs of production down or out. Like unions? Uh, unions isn't quite where I'm going here. How about ingredients? Someone was speaking, but I was having a hard time uh, understanding. Can you say that again? Or someone else? Something about ingredients. Policy? John, what do you mean by policy? Laws? So here the law is, um, the government is saying, we've got, this, we've got this price ceiling and you can't sell bread for higher than that. Uh, so you're exactly right there. And so my question is, how do these bread manufacturers respond in a way that allows them to shift their marginal costs uh, of production to um, semi-satisfy this, this higher level of demand? Can I answer or do you still want me to be quiet about this? I want you to be, be quiet for just a little bit longer, Christina. And then if everybody is making a grimace on their face, then we can, we can come to you. Okay, Christina. So the government comes to these bread, bread manufacturers and says, Screw you guys. You've got this long line of people out here demanding this bread. You better expand your production and you're still not allowed to sell for higher than P bar. How do these bread producers respond? They go find a cheaper ingredient so that they can make the bread and still be profitable, but not let the government know. And so that cheaper ingredient uh, usually isn't bread, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is you want more bread? Fine. We'll give you more bread. We're going to make it out of sawdust, right? So all of a sudden, all of this kind of filler, harmful additive stuff starts getting mixed in so that we expand the quantity, but the quality, the food safety of this stuff is in the tank, right? So we get in this scenario, um, an outward shift in the marginal costs of production, which allows us to expand um, ostensibly expand um, the quantity supplied and therefore the quantity consumed of bread. But the actual effect, the actual outcome here is that we've made this stuff less healthful, less safe uh, for those consumers. Okay, so that was a story, um, a, a big picture story of why we still today have to understand agricultural policy. Because even if we are using these policy instruments in a way that we're trying to make the world a better place, trying to expand um, access to food uh, for poor people, um, trying to give farmers more money in an alternative scenario, um, we can end up making things a lot worse, right? So we said, there are a lot of ways this, this ex specific example could clear. One, um, a black market. The impacts of the black market are that only the really, really rich people get access to bread and there's less bread going around altogether. Second, um, if we crack down on the black market, we're just making people wait in line for hours and hours and hours. Uh, and so they're now sick because they've been standing out in the cold forever and there's still less bread supplied 
or third, maybe these guys expand their production, but they do so um, in a screw you way, right? They do so by putting sawdust uh, in their ingredients for bread, um, which results in less healthful access to bread um, for consumers. Everybody clear on that example and sort of how it highlights um, the potential perverse impacts from good intentions in agriculture. Questions about that? Or comments that I got this all wrong and I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. All right, well, you guys can keep thinking about that, but let's now go to the second part here. Okay. Okay, are you guys seeing my screen? Okay, so we've worked through that example problem. Now let's talk a little bit uh, about who I am just so you can know why you have to listen to this guy just blabbing at you for this whole semester. Um, let's see, is there a way I can expand this so I can see you guys' face while I'm showing, sharing the screen? Amazing. All right, now I see you guys. Okay, so let's talk about who uh, I am. So my name uh, is Alex Schaefer. Um, my preference uh, is that you guys could call me Alex. Um, I think it's weird that you have to address me by professor or doctor or mister, um, just because I'm older than you guys, right? If we saw each other on the streets or if we were born at the same time, you'd call me Alex. Let's just call each other uh, by our, our names. If that's super weird to you, it makes you super uncomfortable. I also will answer and recognize um, myself as Dr. Schaefer. So if, if you don't wanna call me Alex, that's fine. Um, Dr. Schaefer is fine. Uh, who am I? Okay, so I'm an assistant professor. Um, my sort of area of expertise is international markets, trade and policy. Uh, my time here is divided. 75% of my time is spent on research. So research is something I'm really, really passionate about. Hopefully I'll get a chance to show you a little bit about what the heck research means uh, in this space, agricultural policy uh, space. Uh, and then 25% of my time is spent on teaching. So that works out to just two courses a year. In the fall, I teach an ag marketing class at the master's level. And then in the spring, I got you guys, right? So that's a really good news in that it allows me to really focus uh, kind of on this course. Uh, it's really bad news in that if you hate me, um, that's less of the um, course evaluations that I can kind of smooth over. So um, I'm gonna try to, try to do a good job here. Um, my background, I have sort of a weird background uh, in that I am a lawyer, so I have a Juris Doctor. Uh, and in addition to that, after I got my Juris Doctor degree, uh, so I'm a practicing lawyer. I've got, I'm admitted to the California Bar, uh, Bar Association, which reminds me that I've got to renew my license, uh, or I will be lying to you about the fact that I'm a practicing lawyer. Um, but I'm also an agricultural economist. I've got a PhD. I'm fairly, still fairly new to Oklahoma State, right? So maybe you guys don't know me. Uh, and that's because I, I, basically just got here. So um, I joined the faculty here um, in August 2021. So I've been here for only one semester so far. Uh, and so a reasonable question is, why the heck are you here, Alex? Um, I'm, I'm not from Stillwater originally, but I'm just about as close uh, as you can be. So here are some dots. Um, this black dot is Dumas, Texas. That is where I uh, was born and grew up for the first 14 years of my life. Um, and then when I was uh, 14 and a half, I moved to Garden City, Kansas, which is in Southwest uh, Kansas. And that's where I uh, finished um, high school. Um, my parents, so my dad was born in Stillwater. My granddad got his PhD here at OSU. Uh, and then they went on to, uh, my granddad went on to teach at uh, Panhandle State University in Goodwell, Oklahoma for many years. So they're from Goodwell. My mom's from sort of the Boise City area. So most of the people that I've ever known and loved are from this, this Panhandle area uh, of Oklahoma. My wife grew up around um, 
Douglas, Kansas, which I know many of you will have no idea what where that is. It's a little town about an hour and a half north of here. So we're very much uh, home, uh, but it was a long journey getting here. So let me show you a little bit about uh, my education and then sort of my work life after that. Okay, so does anybody know where this is? And if you do, I'll be so impressed with you. <laughs> anybody know where this is? It's, I'm deeply offended. <laughs> so this is friends. I do. Oh, do you? Tell me. Yeah, it's in California. No. Try again. It's closer. Oh, so this is, where is this? Wait, which one are you? I'm sorry. I'm on my phone, so the screen is really small. Okay, I'm just going to delete these. This one. Anybody? Oh, no idea. <laughs> Fair enough, right? Uh, so this is Friends University, uh, which is a tiny little uh, Bible college, uh, Quaker college in Wichita, Kansas. So this is where I went to undergrad. Uh, and you're like, what the heck, Alex? Why would anyone go there? There's only like five people that go there. Uh, and I would be offended and insulted that you would even say that. Um, but it, it was an amazing place. It was the only place where somebody who's sort of a mediocre athlete, uh, a mediocre singer could simultaneously play football and be in the musicals and sing in the choirs and, and have a band. So it sort of gave a, a small town boy um, the chance to do kind of everything you did uh, in high school and feel cool about it. Okay, so that's where I did my undergrad. That's where I met my wife. Um, after that, I went to law school at the University of Kansas, um, got a JD there specializing in international trade and finance law. And then after that, I went and got my PhD at University of California, Davis uh, in California in agricultural and resource economics. But that all happened a long time ago now, right? So it's been, I, I just got here, but it's been a long road getting here. So after that, um, I went to, I moved to Washington DC for a while uh, and I worked at the World Bank, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Um, after that, I moved to a, an assistant professor position in London um, at the University of London uh, in the vet college of the University of London. Uh, my kid got a British accent and I started thinking that was super weird. So we decided to move back to America, uh, to Michigan, um, which sounds nice, except for that it's a frozen hellscape, right? So we, we, <laughs> we moved to Michigan for a while and realized it was much too cold uh, and much too far away from everyone that we've ever known and loved. Uh, and so we moved back here. And so that's where we are now. Um, I keep saying we this is my world, right? So here's a picture of me, but skinnier. Uh, and here's a picture of my wife who still looks like that. Um, and then here are my wonderful daughters, Haven. She's eight. She's in third grade at Westwood. Uh, and this is Ryan. She is five. And she's also, she's a kindergartner uh, at Westwood. That's me. Um, before I started doing work, I used to have hobbies, right? So this is uh, me hiking. I used to like to hike. I still like to hike. Uh, I used to do running. Uh, and then this is me and my wife singing. Um, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the about me section of this thing, which is, I understand more information uh, than you ever wanted to know. That's what I did. But, but now everything you, was on fire. Are there any questions about anything mm -hmm. so far? All righty, so then let's get on to the stuff that you do uh, want to know about. So I hope you've seen the canvas here, right? Uh, has, does everybody have access to the canvas? Obviously you do. That was a stupid question because otherwise you wouldn't be on the Zoom call. Uh, so yeah, um, I did the, so I've worked with many of these online platforms, D2L, um, Learn, Blackboard, uh, and then Canvas has proved overwhelmingly too complex for me. Uh, so last year or, or last semester, I taught the, the master's level course and, and sort of tried to uh, manage it through Canvas and overwhelmingly in the, the student evaluations, they were like, you are a caveman online. You don't know how to run a website. And they were right, but I have since um, taken some of those uh, Canvas tutorials. So I've got 
some rudimentary canvas skills here, right? So here uh, I'll try my best, my darndest to uh, manage this course through Canvas. So here's the home page. You can download the syllabus here. Um, I've also got the syllabus copied and pasted weirdly into the syllabus page. Uh, and then as we work through the course, I will fill in um, these different modules uh, as we work through the course. Okay, so that's where you can find um, the information about the course. What the heck's the course gonna look like? All right, so here's the syllabus that you would download um, if you wanted to download that. Um, my office is 314 Ag Hall, um, and I've got some office hours here. Uh, if those don't work for you, we can make office hours by appointment, but please use my uh, email to do that. Um, just a description of the course that we're going to look at sort of how um, agricultural policy has evolved um, in the U.S. since 1933 uh, to present uh, and how we can use economic tools to understand the impacts of those policies uh, and hopefully improve um, on policies for the future. And we're going to use a little bit of kind of political science, political economy to understand what drives or influences those policies. Are you going to make tacos? Did someone say, am I going to make tacos? Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Oh, was that not to me? <laughs> no, my, I didn't know my mic was on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wish I was going to make tacos. <laughs> Who said that? Are we having a taco party? <laughs> I'm actually making burgers right now, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, so no tacos yet. Um, okay, so this course is Tuesdays and Thursdays um, from 3 to 4.15. We'll meet at 108 Ag Hall. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that room. I went down there for the first time yesterday, and it looks like it'll uh, work really well for these purposes. Uh, we've got some prereqs. If you haven't met these prereqs, uh, let me know and we can kind of talk through whether it makes sense for you to take this course or not. We don't have an assigned textbook for this course. Um, I'm hoping that the lectures and then the material that I provide online will be sufficient. Uh, if you do feel like you want to do some supplemental reading, um, I, I have listed this Agricultural Policy in the United States course uh, in the United States book uh, by um, a guy at Oklahoma State and then some other guys. Um, it's okay. We won't follow it exactly, but some of the, some of the information there will be useful uh, for this course. COVID-19 disclaimer, uh, just the fact that I understand that the college experience for you guys has been hard, right? COVID-19 freaking sucks. Uh, and as a result of that, I want you guys to understand, well, COVID or not, that this isn't a me versus you way that we're going to make it through this semester. This is me and you together trying to learn this course material. Um, and I'm gonna, I promise you, I'm gonna give you guys the benefit of the doubt. I'm on your team. Uh, I want you guys to be on each other's team uh, here and show you guys some, some kindness. Uh, and then if I need it, I hope you'll show me some grace too. COVID has been a hard time for me as well. So much so that I uprooted my family again and then moved back home, right? So, so it's been a hard, a hard time for all of us. Let's just be cognizant of that uh, and show each other some kindness. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, I already talked about what this course is about. Um, let's talk about evaluation. So there are four components um, to this. The first is that at the end of each module, I think we've got five modules, let me see. One, two, three, four, five. We've got five modules here. At the end of each of those modules, we will have a quiz and the, uh, so you'll take five total modules, each were our total quizzes at the end of each of those five modules. Um, each of those will be worth 10 points. And then I will drop your lowest quiz score. So you'll be evaluated on your best four of those five quizzes. Um, 10 points for class discussion and participation. Uh, you guys are adults, 
So I'm not going to tally up whether you're coming to class. I don't care if you come to class or not. I'm not going to tally up how many times you talk uh, in class. You start with these points, right? Uh, and then I hope and expect that everyone will obtain these points throughout the course. Um, it's only, I don't know, in the event of some kind of disruption or, or someone's being sort of counterproductive that we start to worry about those points. But these are points that you start with and I expect everyone will achieve. We've got a group policy project, um, which we'll talk more about at the end, uh, will be divided up into groups. I think we got about 40 people in this course. So we'll be divided up into groups of, of hopefully about five, four or five or six. Uh, you guys will be assigned a topic, a current agricultural policy topic. Um, someone will be pro some regulation in this area. Uh, or, or one team will be pro some, some aspect of regulation in this area. The other team will be con or against this regulation uh, in whatever current policy topic we're talking about. And then at the end, you guys will pr prepare a report just like you'd submit to a court arguing your case, why you think, yes, this policy needs to go in effect or no, this is the stupidest policy that's ever happened. And then we will have... Um, live debates, right? You'll have the pro side lay out their argument, um, the con side lay out their argument and say why the pro side is wrong. We'll have rebuttal and then um, uh, counter rebuttal. And, and we'll at, at the end kind of as a class get to, to vote who we think is, is right. So I hope that that's the funnest part of the course. Um, it will be certainly for me. Uh, and then at, uh, we've got a final exam uh, at the end of this as well. I'll give you um, each week, starting on Thursday, um, a topic for a reflective discussion, uh, a total of 10 of these, uh, and, and each of them is worth one point. So I'll give you this topic on Thursday for the first discussion. You'll have a week to write a reflective discussion about it, just kind of what you think about it using sort of the intuition, the economic intuition, the fact that you guys are all humans who have beliefs and opinions, what you think about this uh, topic. I think it's a 500 word thing. Is that what I said? Gross, it didn't show up in the syllabus. Yeah, so, I never seen anything about how long that was. I was fixing to ask. Uh, 500, what, what, how long is 500 words? A page double space. I, I want to say that's, I think that's like a page. Yeah. I think so, 500 words about a page. Uh, so that'll be about a page double space. I'm not going to word count you. Just like if you've shown sufficient effort to engage with this topic, you get that point uh, for a total of 10 points uh, in these essays. And again, that's one each week where you've got that week deadline. So you can't wait until the end of the semester and then say, oh my gosh, my grade sucks. I'm going to do all of these 10 essays in one night. This is, you have to be consistent um, doing them each week if you want to get those points. Okay. I just looked it up on a double space page. Uh, uh, one page is 250 words. Uh, that's fine. Let's do let's do one page double space. That's that's a lot of thinking, or that's sufficient thinking for a reflective essay. Thanks, Christina. Okay, we got a final exam, which will be cumulative um, on May fifth. I think is the uh, timetable there. Uh, and then we'll have sort of no surprises here in terms of grading and 90 to 100 is an A, 80, 89, B, 70, 79, C, 60, 69, D, and then less than 60 uh, is an F. Any questions so far about any of that stuff? Okay. And so then we'll have, I'll talk you through this tentative course schedule. And so I say tentative, I really mean it, right? We don't know what the heck is going to happen with this Omicron stuff uh, or whether I'm going to get sick or whether you're going to get sick. So this is what we're, what we're planning for right now. So I've got the course broken up into five modules um, where we're trying to, so in this first module, the goal is to work through the broad overview of agricultural policy. So what do you need to understand to understand the context of agricultural policy? Today, I'm telling you how this course is gonna work. This is the course overview. Um, next time, 
on Thursday, I'm going to give you a review of sort of the economic tools that you need for this course. So if we go through Thursday and you're like, I don't know what the heck that guy is talking about, then we'll need to worry uh, a little bit about whether uh, you're going to have the sufficient sort of background knowledge to be able to understand um, what we're talking about. If you are able to sort of understand that, that discussion, uh, able to follow along and kind of contribute, then we're in good, um, we're in a good place to be able to proceed. Then we're going to walk, uh, walk through how agricultural policy gets made in the U.S., um, history of agricultural policy in the U.S. So that's our introduction. After that, so this is online. My hope is that after that, we'll finally be able to meet in person uh, where I won't be muffled by a mask and you guys can hear the words that are coming out of my face and we can kind of talk through uh, where we've come so far, put it all together. You can ask whatever questions you want in anticipation for that first quiz or first exam for that module. After that, we'll move on to um, agricultural production policy. So what kind of tools do we have in place to uh, support um, or um, cap production uh, in terms of price and income supports, um, but also quotas or supply controls? Um, how can we redistribute um, wealth from some actors in the, in the food system to others? Uh, and then talk a little bit about immigration policy. Uh, we'll have another review session and then that quiz. And by the way, these review sessions um, are built in here sort of as a buffer in two dimensions. One is if we run, if we're running long here, we may eat into these review sessions to kind of make sure we get through all of those topics. Another is uh, I want to make sure you're getting all of this information. So if I, if I get sick and I need to miss some days, um, the review sessions will be kind of the first thing that go out the window. We can still have review sessions. They'll just have to be kind of outside uh, regular hours, right? So these will be the first things that kind of get tossed um, when we run into roadblocks. After we're kind of at the farm gate, we're going to um, broaden our perspective and look internationally and see how different trade policies um, affect our production decisions and our returns, our economic returns to agriculture, um, uh, different policies there, uh, how those affect those returns and, and uh, trade outcomes. Then we're gonna go down the supply chain and talk a little bit about how um, end user uh, policies like food labeling and food safety considerations, how those re uh, affect our economic returns to agriculture uh, and farmers. Um, and then after we've done that, we will do some kind of what's the current big hot topic. So we'll have um, a policy extension specialist come, come talk about what are the big debates right now. We'll talk about um, ethanol policy. We'll talk about environmental policy. And then we will be kind of done with the course material and on to you guys' um, debates, which is the fun part of the course that I look forward to. Guys, that is everything in the world that I have to tell you today. Uh, do you have other questions or comments? Did you say you was putting us in groups? I don't know. What We can figure that out. Uh, if you got if you if you're all hot and bothered about being in a group with somebody versus somebody else, um, you guys can sure. You know what? Yeah, you guys are adults. You'll make your own groups, right? So I'll I will uh, probably not till next week. I'll make a Google Doc with sort of a certain number, an, uh, an appropriate number of groups, and then you guys can sign up wherever you want to, with whomever you want to. You might have already mentioned this, but will the quizzes be in person or on Canvas? I freaking hope they're in person. Uh, yeah, I hope they're in person. Is that is that something you're into or is it more convenient for you guys to do it in, on Canvas? I prefer it in Canvas, but I'm in either way is fine. So the only my only hesitation there is, like I said, I'm a total freaking caveman when it comes to Canvas. So if I make a mistake on the quiz in person, you guys can raise your hand and say, you made a mistake. And I could say, yep, you're right. Uh, and then we can just change that or fix that. If I mistake, make a mistake in Canvas, 
uh, we're either not going to find out until afterwards, or I'm going to get 7,000 emails uh, and it's going to be a total disaster for everybody. And you guys are going to be panicking at home. So I'm not sure. I guess we can vote. <laughs> we can vote. Um, at that module review session where we're sort of together for the first time, hopefully we can vote whether we want to do that on Canvas uh, or in person. That wasn't an answer. That was a ramble. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. I also have a quick question about like lecture and whatnot. Um, are you going to post like the PowerPoints and slides ahead of time so we could like print them off and go it and like. So. Jack, my preference is not to do that. So first, I won't use slides. I use, let me show you an example of my notes here. Like I said, I really am a caveman, right? So I have handwritten notes. Christina has seen these exact notes before, but, but I write handwritten notes uh, and then I will um, kind of write those out for you as we go on this, uh, on my, my tablet right here. Um, the reason I don't want to post them beforehand is I want you guys kind of in the zone thinking about these things rather than flipping the page uh, and seeing the answer. So yes, I will post the notes, but it'll probably be uh, retrospectively okay. just because I want you guys in the zone. Okay. These are good questions. Other questions? Will you be giving... Um or like kind of showing us an example of like what we can expect for a quiz, like not right this moment by any means, but just like later on, like, or at least tell us kind of, you know, are you looking at multiple choice, short answer, that kind of stuff? Uh, yes, I will give you um, an example. Let's see. So probably during that review session, um, let me just, the first module is a little bit different than the rest of the modules in that the first module is heavily background information. So um, the first module, yes, I'll give you kind of information about what you can see or what you can expect to see on the quiz in terms of some example problems during that module review session. Um, if you guys just insist on it, I can give you some homework which is totally optional and not graded um, for the future modules, which could be reflective of what you might see uh, on the exam. Okay. That again was just a lot of talking and not a very good clear answer, Riley. That's fine. We, okay. We're all just gonna get it figured out eventually and <laughs> that's all that matters to me. Or not. <laughs> Fair enough. Other questions? These are good questions. All right, if there are no other questions, that is everything that I've got for y'all today. Um, on Thursday, I promised you I will have the reflective essay topic, um, which I'll post on Canvas. Um, and then you guys can bug me about anything I didn't cover here. I am looking forward to this. This is my absolute favorite class to teach. Um, it was sort of a point of bargaining for um, my decision to come to Oklahoma State. So uh, I hope you guys are as excited about it uh, as I am. I will say you are the most upbeat professor I've had for an economics class. So I'm excited to see how the semester goes. Dude, this is fun, man. This is fun stuff. I'm hoping that that uh, you can be as upbeat about it as I am. You guys have no idea what it's like having him as a professor. It's, it's fun and games all day, every day. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Well, we'll see. We'll see if we can <laughs> make that happen. All right. That's all I've got. Uh, if you guys don't have any other questions. All right. See you guys on Thursday.